So I went out as a journalist and I thought I was going to write a book that was saying that all of these people were full of crap. <laughs> Basically, I wanted to create some sort of manual to help people not get scammed because grief is tricky business. And if you've had significant loss, anyone out there watching this will know how tricky and painful it is. You'll pay just about anything for someone to tell you that your loved one is okay and out of pain and right there. But I was like, I'm too smart for this. I'm not going to fall for it. So I went all over the country and four books later, I'm still having these conversations. Look, I'm not telling anyone what to believe. I'm just telling you what happened to me. And you can believe whatever the heck you want. But I've met people who have died and come back. I've met people who've been without oxygen for 30 minutes and they're living miracles. I've met people that have had angel encounters. I've had people who have had Superman strength and lifted cars, you know, to save somebody. So we can't possibly think we know everything. Hi, this is Jennifer Weigel, and this is your superior self. Oh. So excited to be here. <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything less from an award-winning uh, what is it? Emmy award-winning broadcast journalist. Thank you so it's much helpful. for taking the time. This is going to be fun. This has been a long time coming. I've been trying to get you on the show forever. You're you're just too busy. I think you were the one that was busy this summer, but I'm just thrilled that the stars aligned when everything's in retrograde. Sometimes that's actually how it happens. When nothing was working, people say, oh no, retrogrades are when nothing works out. And I said, well, sometimes the thing you've been trying to do for the longest time suddenly lines up and that's what this was. So thanks for having sure, me. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I think so many people, it's so funny how I found you, right? Like I downloaded your book. I think it was stay tuned mm -hmm. when I first got the audible app and for whatever reason, I got into this like mode of like just binge listening to different books. So for some reason, uh, it got put on the back burner. I'll admit, right. And then your other book came out. I'm spiritual. Damn it. Someone mm -hmm. sent it to me. I started reading it and I was like, all right, I need to listen to the book, another book of hers. So I, I searched your name and all of a sudden stay tuned pops up in my library. I'm like, that's weird. I've already had this book. I don't need to buy it. Like what's going on here. Right. must be a <laughs> sign. I got to have this lady on my show. Right. Like this is like, yeah. I was very interested at the very beginning. And now I listen to like most of your book. I think was there three. There's actually four. Four? Four? Mm -hmm. So I've, I've listened to 50% of your of your work. I'm um, thrilled because some people don't even crack one of them open, Trey. So that's pretty exciting stuff. So thank you. You're such a great writer, a great storyteller. I just, for all those listening, go out and get one of her books and just listen to it. Like you you actually do the reading in the audible uh, version and mm -hmm. it's so well put together. But, you know, the reason why you're here is like you're, you're like living proof of... You can, uh, how do I want to say this, right? You can take that leap of faith and go after your dreams, right? And make it on the other side. I mean, you left a six-figure salary with benefits to <laughs> pursue, per, per, pursue your dreams and what your heart was calling you to do. It wasn't easy, though, right? I mean... No, if somebody had shown me the trajectory and how many bumps would be in the road, I don't know that I would have done it again. And I, and I say that honestly, because it wasn't all ease and grace. However, I had to go through those bumps. So I hear, I hear I had this job with CBS. I was a reporter, a news anchor. Everything's wrong. Back to you in the studio. That was my life. I was sent on fires and hit and runs and terrible, tragic situations. And I would argue with my bosses about what the lead was. To me, the lead is who survived, not who died. And I'm like, well, I will get to all the statistics while I'm out at the fire. But to me, it's most important who survived the fire. And it just became too clear that I was not cut out as an empath. And now a lot of people on your show know what that word is. I didn't know what an empath was. I just knew I wanted to tell stories and I wanted to do it well. I wanted to you know, make good money, start a family, all the American dream type of things. So here I had this job at CBS and I didn't want to disappoint my dad who was also in broadcasting. It was it's sort of like my grandfather was in broadcasting. Some families have doctors, some have lawyers, we had broadcasters and writers and storytellers in my family. And I, I didn't want to disappoint any of the lineage. 
But at the same token, Trey, I just knew I was burning it at both ends. I was getting up at three in the morning. I was exhausted. I hated my job. I mean, hated it. And so I would try to pitch stories that had meaning like what's working. And I didn't mean the fluffy stuff. I just meant there are so many people in the community that are making a difference. Can we talk about that? So it was always uphill. So I decided to walk away halfway in my three-year contract. And everyone said I was crazy, but I did, I carved my own way and I did a lot of different things. I've written lots of books. I did radio for a while. I say that I'm a storyteller. The venue has changed. Sometimes it's on stage. Sometimes it's in front of a camera. Sometimes it's on a podcast. I keep telling those stories because I believe the real audience will find you. If you build it, they will come. So that's mm -hmm. what I started to do. Sure. No, that's just, I, I resonate so much with that, right? Because I'm a third generation like railroader, right? And I'm doing yes. the work, kind of the similar work that we are doing, right? And, and I feel that's totally out of my comfort zone for me anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're still speaking, but you, you left um, that grind of um at the news station to pursue pursue um i don't know why i can't say that word right pursue <laughs> like metaphysical mm -hmm. experiences uh with psychics and channels and you know the great unknown like that's totally out of the you know left field for some people right like i mean like what started you down that path of like hey i'm gonna go check out some psychic mediums i want to see what this is about I didn't believe in any of it, Trey, at all. And then my father died at 56. He had a brain tumor. And I just couldn't wrap my head around the fact that he was here one minute and then not. And so I started getting all these sort of signs, which I now know to be winks from the other side. But at the time, I didn't know what the heck it was happening. So I went out as a journalist and I thought I was going to write a book that was saying that all of these people were full of crap. <laughs> Basically, I wanted to create some sort of manual to help people not get scammed because grief is tricky business. And if you've had significant loss, anyone out there watching this will know how tricky and painful it is. You'll pay just about anything for someone to tell you that your loved one is okay and out of pain and right there. But I was like, I'm too smart for this. I'm not going to fall for it. So I went all over the country and four books later, I'm still having these conversations. I, look, I'm not telling anyone what to believe. I'm just telling you what happened to me. And you, you can believe whatever the heck you want. But I've met people who have died and come back. I've met people who've been without oxygen for 30 minutes and they're living miracles. I've met people that have had angel encounters. I've had people who have had Superman strength and lifted cars, you know, to save somebody. So we can't possibly think we know everything. Look, mm. we used to smoke on airplanes and think that was cool. We used to have doctors selling cigarettes on TV. So until we gather more information, and I'm all about that, ask questions, knowledge is power, gather the information. And that's what it's about for me. Sure. What was your first experience, right? Like with a, with a medium? Uh, I maybe mention their name. I don't know if you can or cannot. Yes, but, no, it um, was, it was, uh, I'll, I'll never forget it. I was in my mid twenties and I was basically dragged by a friend out to a, a little farmhouse in Rockford, Illinois, which is a tiny, tiny little, a tiny town at the time. It was tinier. Um, say that three times fast. Yes. Rockford. <laughs> So uh, Denise Gazzardo was her name, is her name. She's still around today and she still works out of a little house in Rockford doing what she does. And she didn't know anything about me. I made sure that my friend only gave my first name. This was before Google or the internet or any emails existing. It was a long time ago. And maybe AOL had just started, but that's about it. And so when I got there and she described to a T exactly uh, at the time i was in i was dating somebody who uh, became my my husband we're we're not married anymore but we're great friends we co-parent our son together but at the time he was considering proposing and she described the exact ring what it looked like and i was just so blown away because when i found out that the ring was the the ring and how would she know this again this woman in rockford so i now know there's lots of people that have sort of antenna wired differently our brains are very powerful. They say that on a good day, we're maybe using 5% of our wiring in our neurons. And so some people have tragic circumstances. I now know after doing hundreds of interviews, you know, over the years of people with different abilities that often a tragedy or some sort of accident or a near death experience or something scrambles your brain, sort of like a snow globe. And the wiring gets a bit jumbled, but it gives people a perspective 
a clair, if you will, clairvoyant is clear seeing, clairaudient is clear hearing, clairsentient, you just sense something. Some people get goosebumps or they get that uneasiness in their stomach. A claircognizant is you just know. I mean, mm-hmm. they call it intuition, mother's intuition, or uh, Norman Vincent Peale called it the power of positive thinking. You just know. So I went into a deep dive on how could this woman possibly know these things? And that's what got me started. A woman in Rockford, Illinois. <laughs> so uh, out of all the spiritual uh, teachers, right? Like, has there been one that really has, like their teachings have really been um, mm-hmm. impactful in your life? Oh, for sure. There have been so many, but at the tip of my tongue, there are two people that completely transformed my life. And one of them is when I was working as a a newspaper columnist. Remember what those were, newspapers? I'm so dating myself on that one. But (laughs) I had worked for the Chicago Tribune. I had a column called Lessons for Life, and I was writing stories that I loved. And all of a sudden, the rug was pulled out from under me. They cut 60 positions. I was one of them. And I was walking out of the building. And I heard as clear as day, Trey, we had to do this. We have plans for you. You got too comfortable there. And I was like, I thought there was a homeless man behind me. That's how clear it was. It was my first real clear audience moment where my higher self, whatever you want to call it, the divine God, whatever deity you believe in, right, was talking to me to let me know that this was actually the way it's supposed to go. As much as you feel like it's happening to you, It might be happening for you. So that day I was having dinner with Carolyn Mace, MYSS, and she wrote several best-selling books. I think eight New York Times bestsellers, including Anatomy of the Spirit was the first one of the first ones on my nightstand. A medical intuitive, didn't want to be a medical intuitive, was an editor for books and suddenly got this gift to see people and know, oh, they have a blocked kidney or, and she worked with Norm Sheely, Harvard brain surgeon, you know, collaborating on So many cases, they wrote books together. So she was coming down for dinner and I called her from the river at Chicago River, you know, (laughs) told her what happened. So she came down and she said, we went to dinner anyway. And she said, it is time for you to invest in yourself. And I was like, huh? She said, invest in yourself. And she told me this story about a woman who basically took the last few dollars she had, flew to New York, barreled her way in to a cosmetics company and said, you need me. And she told me to believe in myself because that I had something to offer and that I was good at what I did and that the right place would appreciate me and I would find my way. If you build it, they will come kind of thing. So that's when I started my live series at this theater in the Chicago area where I would have people come and I would interview different authors. Carolyn was the, one of the first ones I interviewed and I've had Paul Selig and uh, Raymond Moody and all these people come in from all over the, the country to come and sit on a stage with me. And then COVID hit, so we changed it to virtual. And that's when I started my virtu- virtual. So Carolyn Mace, I would say, was definitely, definitely one of them. And the other one is... Dr. Mary Neal. Now, Dr. Mary Neal wrote the book To Heaven and Back, and she is an orthopedic surgeon who died in a kayaking accident. She was without oxygen for 30 minutes. That's the woman I met. That's the living miracle. And she said, I am a pragmatist. I'm a scientist. I wouldn't believe in this if you put a gun to my head. I wouldn't make this up. I'm not a a fantasy thinker, but I know what happened to me. And she was in the light and she got all these messages. And she said to me, listen, If you start taking notes on all those coincidences that you think, that's weird, you will start to realize it happens more often than you can count. And the laws of probabilities, the mathematical laws, wouldn't be able to explain it. The more you acknowledge them and say, thank you, got it. It's like the universe sees that you're turned on. It's like being in the ocean and you set off a flare and you need help. And they see your flare go, And when she told me that, I started, and I got goosebumps right now as I'm telling you this, Trey. I started taking notice. I started taking pictures with my phone every time I saw a heart-shaped cloud or rock or blob or dog, you know. Mm -hmm. They have a sense of humor. Let me just put it that way. And so I would take a picture and post it on my Instagram at Jen Weigel and say, you know, thank you every time it happened. And it started the floodgates of heart-shaped stuff. And I always remember Dr. Mary Neal because she said, it is not a coincidence. It is source. It is God. It is something bigger. It's the divine work. So those two, I think would be the biggest, the biggest influences for me. Caroline, she's, yeah, I've I've listened to a couple of her books, one like sacred contracts or something like that. 
yes. very powerful, impactful, and mm-hmm. she's like direct and right to the point, right? And uh, yeah. it sounds like your experiences with her have been the same, obviously, uh, from mm-hmm. that story. The one thing I I wonder though, right? Like I I think you and I are very similar in our in our journey <clears throat> and how we, you know, we we're seekers of truth, right? And I got to a point I I'm at that point where I'm starting to realize that that, that a lot of the information that that I'm searching for that is it's inside of me. The answers are inside of me, right? Like so, I have downstairs in my in my gym downstairs, which is not really a gym; it's like a, a, a space. Um, yeah. with all the kids stuff, um, mm-hmm. just oh, a corner full of books yeah, all the way up the wall. And it's like, I've read all of them, you know, from quantum f- physics, all the way to philosophy, to psychology, to psychotherapy, astral dynamics, all of that stuff. And at some point, like you have to realize that you're just, you're kind of giving your power away, right? Like you're, you're, yeah. you're giving it away and not really focusing in on you like as that spiritual being, right? Like in, in investing that energy back inward to search right. for yourself. Um, I feel like we've done it our entire lives where, you know, from when we were children all the way up to adulthood. I mean, it's it's a part of life. It's survival. Like you have to rely on other people and right. you always go outward to look for answers because that's how we were taught. Like, how do you research a paper? You go out and you find your sources and you, and you check them, sure. and you fact check and all that stuff, right? It's always outward, but re- recently through meditation and and just kind of going in like a like a like a self inquiry state of consciousness, like things are starting to pop up that um, I couldn't have logically thought of, right? And it, and it makes sense, and I'm starting to see the signs. Like when I ask certain questions, just to some some of that you know altered state. Um, for, I don't want to say voices, but whatever that is, right? That what I think is my higher self, like I'm, it's following it up and backing it up with signs. And it's Mm -hmm. funny because like, I just saw a a video of yours. It's like, um, sign or test, right? (laughs) Yes. Right. Um, right. What are your thoughts on that? Right. Like when you get guidance, inner guidance, yeah, expand on that. So it's interesting. I have had, uh, a lot of what I thought are signs. Sometimes I feel like well, first of all, to go back to your question about going within, it is so true that when you're doing research, you have to go out and and seek others' expertise because I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. You don't ever want to hire me to do your taxes, but I'll tell a great story in front of 10,000 people and not blink. Some people are terrified of public speaking. So we all bring different things to the table. And every once in a while, you need someone to tell you when you've got arugula in your teeth. You know, it just, just you need someone to reflect back to you. I, I liken it to how hard it is to zip up a dress if you live by yourself, somebody you need to get the way back and just get that last little part to get it all the way to the top. You don't have that problem, but you know what I'm saying? So the point is, uh, if if you have somebody there, it's it's bearing witness and and helping you fill in the holes or the gaps, which takes me to community, which is what I have found. When the pandemic hit and so many people isolated, the the connecting even on Zoom was so critical for survival with this community. And I think there's a wonderful series on Netflix you might have seen called The Blue Zones. Mm. And if you haven't watched it, I recommend it. And the reason they call it The Blue Zones is they mark these places on the map of the globe where people have the highest concentration of centurions, the people who live to be 100. And the reason they live to be 100 is because of the community. They have purpose. Often it's diet and and active lifestyle. And, and people are working into their late 90s because they have purpose and community. And that's one of the biggest parts of it. So while we can go within and need to go within, we also need to have purpose. And a lot of times that community can shore us up on that. But back to the signs, I do think it's important, like Dr. Mary Neal said, ask for signs and you'll be shown all these different coincidences. That just shows you that you're not alone. But I think how people mess up those signs, for example, sometimes it's just science that what your frequency is putting out, it attracts back. So if you, Pam Grout is great at this, E squared, E cubed, she writes all these books about manifesting. So if you start focusing on the frequency of pulsating blue car, blue car, blue car, you're going to see blue cars everywhere. Now, what do you associate that meaning of the blue car? I I, uh, coached a woman 
who was really stuck on this guy and all signs pointed that he was the worst person for her. But she says, but I keep seeing a red Mustang everywhere and that's what he drives. So that must be a sign that he's meant to be mine, you know? And I said, no, it's a sign that all you are is thinking about that red Mustang that he drives. (laughs) Sometimes you're just presenting the frequency of something. And so you see it because it's what you're putting out there. It doesn't mean he's for you. So I always say that our thoughts are so powerful. Here's a great tip. After you think a thought, just imagine that it's going out to universe with the sentence, and so it is. I never have luck on blah, blah, blah. And so it is. I always get ripped off. And so it is. I never meet a nice partner. And so it is. I need a new job. And so it is. Just remember, and so it is, is after everything you say. So if you say, thank you for the signs that show me without a shadow of a doubt what I'm supposed to do about this. And so it is. It's just flipping that dialogue. So lately, I believe when we decide to make a very strong decision about something like putting up a boundary, sometimes it will be a test to see if we really mean it. So we put up a boundary and then somebody will try to sneak back in through the side door and try to show you a side of themselves just to get back into your good graces when they've shown you time and time and time again, they're not reliable, they're not kind, they're toxic, they lie, whatever it is, sometimes they will test you. Because if you say, show me the next steps for my highest good and the highest good of all involved, no matter how it shows up, help me trust it. It all goes back to intention. Does that make sense? That was a really long answer to a very No, I really like that, right? Like, and I want (laughs) to, and I want to clarify something, right? So I agree. Community is important because it, 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 as long as you're in the right community, right? Like if you're, you know what I mean? The average of the five, that kind of rule. Yeah. Um, Yeah. As long as you're in the right community, I think it is, um, is very impactful to your growth, right? And Mm -hmm. like, to your point, you can be a mirror for that individual to kind of see where the blind spots are, like subconscious programs that pop up when you say things or, and, or behave in a way that's sabotaging your growth. A hundred percent agree. Mm -hmm. I think what I want to clarify is that when you get to a certain point in your development, there's not a, there, there won't be enough books or there, 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 there seems to be too, too many books, right? You start getting confused on the, on your development, right? Like Mm -hmm. they can only take you to a certain point before you have to take that leap of faith for yourself and really find out who you truly are. I got Mm -hmm. to that point where I, if I read another near death experience book, like I'm just kind of muddying, you know what I mean? Like I'm just, it doesn't make any difference to me. I I, I already understand their point of perspective and it's kind of like, all right, I need to have my own experience, right? Whether that's through Mm -hmm. meditation, uh, experiencing this reality from a different perspective, maybe, um and uh i don't know uh connection with other people right like the way that they connect in those near-death experiences to sure to un- fully understand what that that love feels like right like maybe I, I might not be able to experience it in this form how they explain it as being totally unconditional right because i'm always going to have as in this in this state of consciousness like let's just face it right like i don't know if we fully are you know uh unconditional in our love right like i mean i just think it's a, it's 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 a part of being a human right like we put conditions on things but sure. i guess my point being is that i had to take my own power back and kind of invest more time in my development spiritually through meditation and then like having my own experiences and not yeah. worrying about what other people said about maybe uh, you know is it scientifically proven or how can you objectify it how can you falsify it right and Mm -hmm. don't worry about what you know scientific um, individuals might say if hey you you've had this meditation where you're speaking to a guide or you're speaking to your your past loved one and they're giving you these signs and they're showing up in your reality prove that to me right i can't prove that to you because it's my subjective truth right i think you get to a certain point where you need to put more emphasis on your subjective truth Mm -hmm. and not feel bad about that Right. And not completely. completely. And I, I talk about it, your healing hygiene, like your operating system is going to be different than my operating system and my healing hygiene. Some people, when they shower, wash their face first, some people wash their hair first. Like everybody's got a different method and your method is your method. And I tell people, you have to take a little from column A and a little com- from column Z and be a combo platter that works for you. Take a little from each book. Sometimes one book We'll have one page, Trey, that I want, and that's it. I'm like, well, that's what I bought this for, and I'll put it down. And maybe I'll go back and check it out later, but sometimes that's enough. 
And at the end of the day, it is all a test for us to build up our muscles. I'll give you a perfect example. No matter how much everybody says their opinion of something, you have to trust this person. You have to do this. You, well, what if you don't get a good feeling and your personalities don't mix and you don't know why? So case in point, recommended this person to watch my child. I had to do a book talk. I was going to someone's house, left my very young child with the most recommended babysitter in the in the planet. And something when when she came to the door and all oh, everybody recommended her, I got this feeling, that Claire sentient gut. Oh, and it was like, ignore it, pay no attention, because I gotta go. <laughs> it's like, bye. You know, it was like, oh gosh, I'm just getting in my head. La 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 la. I got in the car. Well, spirit intervened. I had forgotten my phone at the time it was a Blackberry. So I turned the car around to go get my Blackberry and she was dipping her she was making herself a vodka and lemonade and she was 16 years old and mm -hmm. my two-year-old was climbing around and I was like, okay, guess what? The two-year-old's going in the car and he's coming to book club. You know, I sent her home. I took my son with, he had a great time at book club, but I should have listened to my body. My body was telling me one thing and everything else was telling me another. So always trust your inner GPS. It always knows best. We just don't give it that credit that it deserves. Mm. Have you been able to like since your last book or, or whatever, right? Like, have you been able to really cultivate like and strengthen that inner communication with like either your guides or your father or God even, right? Like source, universe, whatever, right? Like, have you been able to cultivate a stronger relationship and what does that look like? Absolutely. And it looks different every day, but I know now to trust that voice that feeling for me, it, there's a physical, when I was a kid, I was a chronic stomach ache, ear, nose, and throat disaster. And a lot of that was because I wasn't speaking my truth. I know that now I had sore throats all the time, strep all the time, earaches all the time. This whole shocker was just bundled up with what I wanted to say, but didn't feel I was safe to say it. And then I would get these stomach aches. They would take me to the doctor and the doctor would say, oh, she's making it up for attention. I mean, it's just awful. And now I know that second chakra was really my GPS. I know now my operating system, but it comes with practice, 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 practice. It's just like you can't run a marathon by running 10 minutes. You have to work up to it. And so all these years I've been working up to it. Another great uh, mentor for me has been Pat Longo, who wrote the book, The Gifts Beneath Your Anxiety. And she discovers and teaches a lot of intuitive people. She discovered Teresa Caputo, the Long Island medium, um, Marianne DeMarco, all these people that are on the East Coast. There's something in the water in Long Island, <laughs> I got to tell you. And so she looked at me several years ago. She came to one of my interviews on stage and said, are you ready to do this yet? And I was like, what are you talking about, lady? I interview people like that. I don't do that. And she was like, there's purple all around you. You've got this. Just it, It's going to require you practicing it. And I've always been like this, just kept pushing it away, pushing it away, pushing it away. It's only been in the last year when I finally said, you know what? I'm going to listen to exactly what I'm getting and I'm going to say it. I'm going to speak it. I was just afraid of hurting people's feelings. But at the end of the day, it was really helping people. And that's when it feels right. When you are given a message that you feel impressed to share with somebody, whether it's the checkout line at the grocery store or with a dear friend at dinner, and you hear it and you hear this, say it. I, as Pat Longo says, deliver the mail with grace. It's all in the delivery and say, you know, this might be kind of strange. Here's a good way to couch it. I had the weirdest dream. Let me tell you what happened. Then when you say I had a dream, it doesn't seem as cray cray, you know? And so that's what I've started doing. And so what does it look like? It looks like me just trusting it more and more and more. Another example, I was with this one woman and I, I got this really distinct feeling. She was stuck. Like she was wanting to be more creative, but she didn't know how. And then I saw like Beethoven, Brahms, Mozart, like the classics, right? And I said to her, I said, I know a lot of people say they get motivated, you got to be quiet, but I'm hearing the exact opposite for you. And I'm actually thinking it might be classical music. And she's like, I love classical music. And then I said, I am seeing like a bust of Beethoven, like a bust. And she laughed so hard, apparently in her house, Trey, she's got a bust of Beethoven carved in the wall with like a light on it. And I was like, well, that's a first. So 
The point is, if this can happen to me, it can happen to anyone because I was as skeptical as anybody could possibly be. And all I did was try to get quiet and decide that I'm going to let my Claire's tell me because my intention is to heal and connect. If your intention is to manipulate and make money or be famous, it's not going to be the same outcome, I don't think. So mm. if you have a pure intention of helping and connecting, then that's what it's all about. Mm. I love yeah, that. But it's, it's been wild. I got to tell you. I mean, this stuff is happening more and more. Have you ever gotten to a point where you're just kind of like, I'm, like I'm, I might not be made for this, right? Like, I, have you ever yeah. gotten to the point where you're like, I'm done? Like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I'm going back to my, my nine to five salary job. Uh, a few t a few times during the pandemic, I I literally started applying for those jobs that I used to do as executive producer of this or working in this and da 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 da. And I just decided, no, I can't. And as just when I would get to the point of almost taking the job, something would intervene. A speaking gig would show up, or uh, I would get hired to do a conference or something in the in the spiritual world. So anytime I got close to throwing in the towel. I would either get a letter from somebody saying, keep doing what you're doing. I love your work. Or I just listened to your podcast and it changed my life or my trajectory is totally altered now. And so I feel like God works in mysterious ways and wants to keep you on a certain path. If that really is your divine path, even if you don't see how it's going to end, just be present. So yeah, for sure. I've been close. Sure. Wow. So many, so many people can resonate with that. I'm sure there are people listening right now that have, that, that have similar stories to where they're just totally burn out or, and want to do something or pursue something that really lights their heart on fire. And you're the, you are an example of that, that courage to be able to do that. But, um, you did, you did wait until your father passed. And the story of that is remarkable. The signs that are associated with that were remarkable. Um, how did, how did your friends and family, right? Like, how did they react to this? And how did you okay. push, how did you push through that? So, um, they're, they're sometimes it's so interesting. The families that we come in with, they are not on board with any of this. Nobody is in my family. When my dad would have been open to it. In fact, he was open to it before he got sick. I remember I handed him the book talking to heaven by James Van Prague and I had just gotten it and he read it cover to cover. And then he actually came with me to that psychic in the farmhouse. I, I kidnapped him and we drove up to Rockford. Yeah. I remember that story. And he, yeah. yeah. And he had a really emotional experience about his mother, Virginia, who, as we are recording this today, would have been her 102nd birthday, but she passed away many, many years ago, my mm -hmm. grandma, Virginia, but my dad and um, his mom were so close and he wanted to to see if this psychic in Rockford could give a message. He didn't know the difference between a psychic, a medium or, or what, you know, a robot. I mean, it was just sort of like, well, is this, he came along for the ride. So I think if he were still here, he might be open to this, but everybody else is just sort of annoyed by my pursuing this thing. That's busting open the uh, foundation of the Christian faith that we were raised under. I had a great grandpa who was a Lutheran minister. So that Lutheran base, and I was, I was Episcopalian and, and confirmed Episcopalian and they're not fans of what they don't understand. And so therefore there's a lot of fear around it, that it's the devil or what have you. And, um, and even just last night, Trey, we had this incredible zoom with this woman who's a channeler and she gets this channeled message that she says is Jesus coming through with what you're talking about, loving thyself, love yourself because you can't give what you don't have. So if your cup is empty, how can you share with another so love thyself, love thy neighbor as thyself. And when you are filled up, you can be the best version of yourself was the message that came through. So I called a friend afterwards who was a card carrying Catholic. Oh, I just heard my Chicago accent very hard there. Card, my hard, <laughs> art, a card carrying Catholic. And he said to me, well, be careful. That was obviously the devil. And I said to him, the devil would bother to come into my spiritual social club on a Zoom and say, love thyself. So you can be a better version of yourself. Oh yeah. I think that's a good message from the devil. Like, Oh, come on. And that is why so many religions are losing customers. If you will, they're losing people day and day because of all this judgment. So the reality is 
the judgment is the farthest thing from what Jesus was and what he represented about loving all, especially thyself first. And we have to flip that script. So my family is not happy with my going down this path. They all didn't understand why I would leave a six figure salary at a major station to go do this work, but I know it was the right thing to do. And maybe someday they'll figure it out that it was the right thing too. But as of right now, not big fans <laughs> at all. <laughs> well, how do you like, um, how do you raise a son, right? Like in this and how do you, how do you teach him to be open-minded and to explore and to go within and search for your own answers? It's interesting because, uh, very, very young age, he was able to hear and see my father. My dad died six years before he was born. And when he was two, we heard him in the baby monitor talking about it and talking to, he said, the guy who was giving him fire trucks. And then he saw a picture of my dad and said, Hey mom, that's the guy. So um, I think we talk very openly about it. And if there's any parent out there that's watching this and your kid is talking about an imaginary friend, you nourish that and you ask more questions. You don't shut it down. And that's what we did. when in my house, we, we nourished it and I did anyway. And we pray, we pray, we believe in God. We talk a lot about coincidences and signs and meditation is super important to combat anxiety. And that is one of the main, uh, the main driving points in our household is to calm the body and the heart rate and the stress levels. Cause stress is big with kids and young adults right now. And they don't understand that a lot of what they're feeling isn't their own energy. So they're so empathic, their energy field is going out about six feet. And we really have to think of it, Trey, as like the brightness of a light bulb or these candles over here. See that tight and bright. Keep your light tight and bright. That's what I tell my son all the time. Keep your light tight and bright. Just burn off the fog. Put on the high beams. Because if you have the frequency of high beaming light, then the darkness can't reside in that frequency. It's matching mm -hmm. frequency. So that's science. So if we can get our head around the science of it, it's really not so strange. It's just opening up to that. So I try to talk about that frequency, light. We always talk about the light. Don't get swayed by the dark, knowing your inner GPS, your compass, and calming down your parasympathetic nervous system with deep breaths and all of those things. And with kids, it's hard. It's sort of so hard to be like, okay, did you breathe? Are you breathing? <laughs> yes, mom. Yes, mom. I'm breathing. Okay. I'll text him to remind him at school. Breathe, breathe surround, okay, ground. Sends you an emoji. Back. Yeah, he sends an emoji <laughs> back. Um, we need a breathing emoji, Trey. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chicago does it have a lot of like um, open-minded mystics or and or uh, like channelers, like psychics. Like I feel like I don't know too much about Chicago outside of the Cubs and the Bears. Um, yeah, I went. To, I went to L.A. Right and. I love LA. I love Cali. I love the energy over there. Never been to Arizona, but I hear a lot of great stories about portals and things over there. Um, what's Chicago like? What's that scene? So there is something in the ley lines, people say, if you're familiar with that term, uh, right by the Lake Michigan. And I believe a lot of history, a lot of energy from the Native Americans that were uh, occupying this area. There were several tribes that came together. I was at a golf outing just to show you how, and this woman pulled me aside and said, I, uh, Jen, I am aware of your work. I just wanted to show you this one spot where the rivers come together, where all these tribes used to live together in the late 1800s. And flowers that are supposed to be this tall are like 10 feet tall there, Trey. There is a frequency. Again, it goes back to frequency. There's a vibration it, with this area. So people are really open to it. You just sort of have to pick your pick your audience, but there's all sorts of meditation centers around in Chicago. And like I said, I used to do my live events here. People love to come through here on their way to LA from New York. It's not nearly as spiritual as Long Island. Long Island, just like I said, has something in the water for sure. LA and Sedona probably has a little bit more of it as well, but there's a hub for sure right along the lake. And I attribute it to some frequency of when a lot of different tribes worked together to live here and to heal and to cohabitate before mm -hmm. a lot of things went down. The Chicago fire in 1871, I think, really disrupted that frequency a bit. And then things like Al Capone and, you know, all of the things that were Chicago crime started getting known for the wrong reasons. But there's definitely an energy uh, community here for sure. Mm. So you you covered a lot of that, right? In your in your career, 
Um, I mean, there is no sh- shortage of like just you know how you know how the the, the mass media is and the mainstream media. Like, but do you see like there is something going on, right? Like, I feel like there's something that this world is going towards something, right? Like, there there is going to be either a uh, an ascension of some sort, or like I don't know, like an apocalypse. I don't know, but like, what are like some of the psychics channels that you've interviewed? Like, are they saying anything? Like, what's to come? What's our future as as society? Oh yeah, it's changing. It's never going to go back the way it used to be. So you're seeing these paradigms shifting, belief systems shifting, structures having to be rebuilt. You know, even if it comes down to our government and the the policy of our government. You know, it's really interesting. I just led a trip. So I lead trips every year. Well, I didn't for a couple because of COVID, but I'll take these spiritual trips. Spiritual Social Club goes global, if you will. And we went to Croatia in August of 2023 here. And It was fascinating. Dubrovnik is the town that got famous because of Game of Thrones. They film a lot of Game of Thrones in Dubrovnik, but I haven't seen any of Game of Thrones. When I heard there was all sorts of decapitating and serpents and stuff, I was out. But all my friends went on this tour and I instead went on a historical tour of medieval Dubrovnik. And I learned this. They talked about their reign and the and when all the conquerors would come in like Napoleon or the Venetians, they really sort of let them be. They had two major exports, gold and salt. And they're like, hey, they're cool. Let them be. They've got their thing. But the other piece was this, their government tray, when they would elect an official, they had to be of noble descent, okay, over 50, you had to live in the government building without your family for your reign. And guess how long the duration of their reign was in Dubrovnik? No idea. One month. (laughs) One month, because they figured that was the only way they couldn't mess it up. They literally would come in and just keep facilitating what was put into place from the previous monarch and just keep it going because they had seen all of these governments, these families, these established reign, you know, kings, et cetera, mess things up, kill over ego and all the wrong reasons. And so they decided to come up with their own construct. So I think Dubrovnik had it going on once a month, just one leader a month and just keep going like that. And you should see the line of these leaders. Yeah. So we have to come up with a new way. I think it's it's just got to change. And that's what a lot of these Zooms that I do, the interviews that I do, there's a lot of similarities in the predictions, if you will. It's interesting because free will comes into play. So not everybody's going to be able to predict everything that happens, but there are these major branch points, if you will, sort of like destiny points that have to be hit at some point, I think, in individuals' lives. And then, of course, as a collective. And we are going through some severe growing pains. And if people aren't willing to be flexible during that growth, then they are just going to be broken by it. So we have a choice to to bend and be flexible like a palm tree or to stand and be rigid and get snapped. Mm. And I'm noticing some people are snapping A lot of people are checking out literally by passing away very suddenly. A lot of sudden deaths are happening and it's, it's just, it's traumatic in a lot of ways, but also I think an opportunity sort of like the Phoenix rising over the flames, right? After you burn away all this dead grass, then we can have new seeds come and a new garden can show up. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and all of the ET stuff that's coming to, um, coming to ground right and on the news like do any of your um guests and or speakers talk to ets or anything like that you know i have had some people talk to me about experiences and again it goes back to that whole light versus dark i believe there's an entire community of ets that are trying to help get us through this transition this transformation that they're here to help for good reasons that I don't think the crop circles that they're leaving us are, are symbols of bad things. I think they're trying to communicate and give us frequencies and give us information. Um, I mean, you could go back to Egyptian times. I believe that they have been traveling here. And a lot of people watch those shows too, right? Ancient aliens. Sure, yeah. There's a lot of evidence that, that we've not been the only ones in this universe for a very long time. Uh, but I think that they also keep things from us because of uh, the w- worry for mass panic. If it becomes very clear that there were, uh, and I think I just I just posted on Instagram something where it was a fossilized mummy of a, a you uh, of of an alien basically found in a mountain uh, of algae in Mexico that came to light that it was in a court hearing. They're showing this evidence that's ancient. It's petrified. It's ancient. It's a fossil. So this. 
is coming out more and more. There are leaders in Canada that are saying we are a global collective that is, you know, a universal planetary, multi-planetary collective. So it's going to be coming up more and more. We can't just think that we can just go back to getting the milk delivered in our glass containers outside and it's 1953. It's just not. Go back to smoking in airplanes, right? We can't there you that. go. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to that. What yeah, about similar? Simil- yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but look how far you've come, right? Like just thinking about like listening to your story. And um, I mean, even for myself, right? Like that small town guy, like blue collar guy. And then like thinking about what we're, we're having a conversation about ETs and and uh, the metaphysical, right? Like never in a million years did I ever think, you know, I was a God fearing Christian Methodist little, mm-hmm. little guy, right? Like scared to death to read the book of Revelation. And here I am talking about um, there is no hell. That the only hell that there is, is the one that you make it. Um, right. Correct. And I just, I, I think the world is ready for a change. Like to your point, uh, I just don't think organized religion um, has enough, have, has enough juice or the right juice to do it because I think um, people are just tired of being, being controlled and manipulated and the fear aspect of it. Right. Like I just feel right. everyone has this feeling inside of them. Like this can't be right. Like there's some parts of the Bible that feel good. I think there are, I don't think the entire book is wrong. I think there are parts of it that are spot on but then there's other parts that like it's like what like don't you there's so it's so weird how the old testament and new testament are like totally different right it's kind of like the the masculine and the feminine right like the masculine is that hard type like hard nose you got to follow me and the feminine is a new testament where it's kind of like love right it's true true. and and if you go even just from the research point because i'm so obsessed with research and as a journalist I went back to see when was the Bible put together and it wasn't even compiled until some, some theologians think at least 80 years after Jesus died. So imagine how your family changes a story after 20 minutes, try 80 years. So these, these stories and these faithful, amazing fireside chats, because that's really what they were. It was fireside storytelling going on for dozens and dozens of years till finally somebody said, you know, we better write this down or, or let's chisel it onto templates because we don't have pens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're going to chisel some pictures and did it. Yeah. Then let's do that. And then, and then they're finding all of these lost, the lost gospels. Right. And because it was truly a PR machine that they put it together to get people to go back to church out of fear, let's use this one and this one. And, and we're going to put these together and this is going to be the one we're going to use. Oh, throw those ones out. Oh, Mary Magdalene. Nope. Thomas. Nope. Let's throw all those gospels out over there. And this is what we're going to go with. And then this is what we go with. And we do what we do until we know more information. And so that's why I tell people to keep asking questions. If you hear a story, like you say, and you sit in church and it feels good, that's happened to me a lot. Resonates, loving, caring, perfect. Take it. But then if you're standing there and you watch the person that's mean to everybody Monday through Saturday, but they're up there talking and telling everyone to do on a Sunday, and that feels off to you, then go home, (laughs) get out of there. It's not your thing. Don't make it a fit. Don't force it a fit out of fear. I tell people that a lot. You know the difference between what feels like fear and what feels like love and trust that loving feeling. And that is what will get you to the next loving feeling because like attracts like. So you have to keep going down that love vibration. And it really is, the Beatles had it right. All you needed is love. Absolutely. Um, and then, and they had an Indian guru, I think. Um, yeah, they did. <laughs> they mm-hmm. did for sure. So, and, and to that point, right? Like feel, feel the good and go towards the good or what you resonate towards. Sometimes it can be tricky because you're going against old programs that are in the body, right? Like mm-hmm. when we, when we start experiencing going outside of our comfort zone and testing knowledge or, and or meditation and, um, I don't know, like experiences, I like think a part of me that kind of you know, hits a wall and says, that's not right. That's your, just your imagination. But then like, you'll see supporting signs that come out of nowhere that support the, the meditation and, or conversation. Like, um, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. Um, okay. So this is something that's happened to me where I had a conversation with my grandfather in meditation. Mm-hmm. He's passed and he's, he's, he handed me, and I've said this in, in a different interview or a podcast where he's handed me like a little like pocket knife. Okay. I asked him what this was for and he didn't really say, cause I, I couldn't, you know, it wasn't like he was speaking. He was just kind of showing me like, 
use it to to cut down your your path essentially right go out into the woods make your own path don't follow everyone else's so it was a great meditation I told my mom about it i was like that's pretty cool it was like when i first start, started getting into this work and then probably a month later i'm walking down the steps and here sits the same pocket knife right i mean wow. yeah and I don't know how this pocket knife got there. Like, I I just don't, I, at first I didn't even think anything of it. I was just, what's this pocket knife doing here? And I picked it up mm-hmm. and I was like, holy. And then when I picked it up in my hand, right. I was like, it took me right to the meditation. And I was like, holy crap. And I re- immediately ran in, and told my wife. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's no, nothing really that I, can I take that to science and say this happened and, and prove it? No, I can't. But I've had that experience. Right. So, and you, and that's exactly right. So what you say, like I said earlier, don't tell anyone what to believe. Just tell them what happened to you. They can decide for themselves. Miracles are when time and space is it's being bent just for you. And that's what happened. Cool. And, I see, and I see on your posts too, like you have like a thousand, like you have these photos of like rock hearts, like your yeah. like the license plates that you, that you take, right? Like, or just. Oh my like, gosh. I, I, they speak to me in license plates because. I have said when I get them, I say, that's great because I love words and I, I'm a writer. So show me in words. To your point about praying in a meditation, I did a deep meditation where I forgave somebody who really, really did awful things. And I and I saw my dad there and it was, it was, it was a very big release. And I said, you know what I did? I cleaned up my side of the street. I can't come, I cannot c- control what they do, but I did what I could on my side. So as I was driving, I was saying that. Dad, that was, I hope you, I hope you're proud here. I'm I'm feeling pretty good about just cleaning up my side of the street. It just feels good to release it. And just then a car gets in front of me and the license plate said, your dad, come on, come on, right right there, right there. And I thought, you know what? You cannot make this crap up. And the, to move the mountain of, to make that car be right in front of me after I did that meditation, that was some serious chess moves right there from spirit. And that's what they're doing. They are putting things in our path, those little breadcrumbs, and they put maybe 10 of them and hope we catch at least one. But when you're in this work, like you are Trey, you're going to catch all 10 because you're open to it. You're not with the blinders on. You're not so caught up in your to do's that you're going to miss them. You're saying, please show them to me. And that's what I, uh, I invite everybody who's watching this today from this moment on. Say, show me the signs. I'm going to keep my eyes open for those now, whether it's a heart shape or a license plate. And when you start seeing them, they'll keep going, keep going, keep going. You'll just get so excited and have a friend that you can send them to because that's how it started for me. Now I've got a a dozen people that on a group text when they happen, I send them off. I was with a woman in this trip in Croatia and, and I said to her, what are your signs? And she said, purple cars. I go, purple cars. She said, yeah, because I just want it to be super rare. And I said, so when you need a, a boost to know you're on the right path, you ask, show me purple cars. So that's sure enough. Within two seconds, Trey, a purple car goes the other way in Croatia. On the, And we went, oh. and then two minutes later, another purple car. And I just went, wow, they are really hitting you over the head with an anvil today. This is good. And that's how it goes. You say, I'm open. I'm open for signs, open for business. Put your open sign on. You'll see what happens. Jen, this has been awesome. Yes, it has. I really, really love it. So now you've got to come on my podcast. So I'll get you on my schedule and we can continue the conversation because I love talking to you. How can people reach you? Where can they find your stuff? Right. Because I know um, you have four books out that I highly suggest. And I think you have a YouTube out as well. I do. And I'm, I'm very active on Instagram at Jen Weigel, but my website is just, all of that is there. Jen Weigel.com, J-E-N-W-E-I-G-E-L.com. We do these Zooms every week, very intimate, cool group of people. And then I'm still doing live events as well. I'm heading to Denver uh, to, coming up in a little bit. So it's just, it's fun to be busy and to keep having these conversations. I just go with the flow, Trey. It's the only way I know how to now. <laughs> <laughs> Go with the flow. What What yeah. is your saying? You are where you're supposed to be. Be in every moment. Even if it feels like crud, you are where you're supposed to be. You never mm-hmm. know. If you're stuck in traffic, you could be missing an accident up ahead. So just mm-hmm. accept it and breathe. <laughs> Sounds easy, right? Sounds too easy, right? But, yeah. you know, sometimes yeah, truth. Said that, yeah. yeah. Jen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.